Everyday citizens are, of course, essential to democracy, but do they have a big enough voice in it as it's currently constituted? Hélène Landemore thinks not and lays out her argument for reform in Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century. She's an associate professor of political science at Yale University and Hélène Landemore joins us now from Paris, France. A great pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Steve, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Not at all. Happy to have you here. Let's start with an excerpt from your book, and then we'll go on and chat after that. One could argue, you write, that the crisis of democracy as we know it, which has come to be symbolized for many by Trump or Brexit, is a sign of its vitality as a normative ideal. People throughout the Western world resent and distrust their political personnel and institutions precisely because they fail to deliver the promise of democracy, people's power. The silver lining of otherwise disenchanting events is that they tap into an obvious desire to gain or regain control and wrest power from runaway elites. The crisis of democracy could be, in other words, a case of frustrated, perhaps even rising democratic expectations coming to terms with the limitations of an existing paradigm. Okay, Ellen, let's dive into this. What are the, the limitations of the quote unquote existing paradigm that you think Brexit and Trump were trying to challenge? I think the limits of the existing paradigm have to do with the limits of um, elections as a way to select our democratic representatives. We find out uh, over and over again, time and time again, that the people we send to parliaments in particular fail to deliver the policies and laws that uh, would actually improve the lot of uh, the majorities. And so, I think there's a frustration that after so many promises of vote for me and then you know um, things will improve, people are starting to question whether the system that's in place is actually meeting the um, normative ideal of people's power. And and uh, for some, the temptation is then to turn to authoritarian solutions um, because they think that uh, the sort of shortcuts through the, the strong men is going to restore people's power. But I, I think for many people, it's just a, the, this um, disillusionment with um, uh, the electoral version of representative democracy and the hope that we can perhaps create something better, more participatory, more deliberative, more inclusive uh, of all people. Well, in this province and in this country, we've been doing it this way for more than 150 years in the United States for more than 200 years. If you're going to change something that's that ingrained, I guess we need to know in particular what you find so problematic about it. What's the problem? The problem is that uh, it's uh, it was born that this electoral system was born at a time when we thought that in order to um, create smart groups, you needed to put in them a lot of very smart, competent people. It turns out that social sciences um, tell us, and experience tells us that in order to have a smart group, a, a group that's good at solving problems, making good laws, identifying the, the right solutions, uh, you're better off with a group that's a lot more diverse than it is uh, individually competent. So we'd be better off with a groups of uh, lawmakers in particular that are uh, tracking much more of the diversity that's present in the larger public and perhaps have uh, slightly less education or uh, fewer diplomas, but really bring in a diversity of perspectives and life experiences that can enrich the way we approach collective problems and solve them. So that's that's the, 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 the novelty here. And, and the problem with elections is that they select for certain kinds of people that go to the same schools, um, share a certain worldview, whether it's neoliberalism or, you know, or another trend. And um, they tend to think the same way and get stuck in the same sort of suboptimal uh, you know, places. Whereas if we opened up the center of power to more and more different people, I think we would see uh, better policy and lawmaking. I was actually quite struck by the way you described it in your book, where you talked about those who are, quote, too shy, too ordinary, too weak-willed, or too inarticulate to stand out in the eyes of other citizens. Now, those those are not, those qualities you just described, they are not the traditional or typical qualities that we tend to want to elect to high office. So why do you think that their rights to be seen and heard ought to be especially significant when designing a better democracy? Well, for one thing, 
it's uh, the meaning of democracy. It's the meaning of, you know, uh, one person, one vote, one person, one voice. We shouldn't have to be smarter or more competent or, or you know, uh, score higher on an IQ test in order to, to have a say on, about the common destiny. So if we are true Democrats, which I think uh, we are not, uh, we should be committed to this fundamental equality and, and distribution of a political office in an equal and inclusive manner. Second of all, because of what I just said about the, the components of collective intelligence, I think we'd be better off including those people who seemingly uh, don't have much to contribute or perhaps are shy and uh, inarticulate, but um, actually bring in a diversity of perspectives, information, life experiences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and may in fact measure up to the occasion in a group in a way that is largely unpredictable. And so uh, that sounds scary, maybe um, you know, on the face of it, to, to sort of uh, gamble on, on people who don't have identifiable qualities ex ante. But we have enough experience at this point, empirical evidence that. Um, this works uh, when you when you randomly select groups, um, um, uh, individuals to take part in so-called citizens assemblies. There is a, a magic called collective intelligence that can emerge under the right conditions and that delivers the good. Um, in fact, uh, Canada is famous for hosting one of the first such experiments. Um, of the modern era, because this was commonly practiced in ancient Greece, but hasn't uh, been practiced in, in you know uh, two thousand years. Um, you had a, 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 this uh, Citizens' Assembly on Electoral Reform in, in British Columbia in 2004, where, uh, whereby 160 randomly selected citizens got together for a few months and made a proposal to reform the, the dysfunctional uh, electoral law. And that proposal was put to a referendum where it, uh, it didn't pass because the threshold was too high, but the, the proposal itself was of high quality and, uh, and, and spoke to the, the, the potential of this of uh, such uh, assemblies and, and diverse uh, groups of citizens. Well, we tried the same thing in the province of Ontario, which is where I'm located, in 2007, where they created a citizens assembly with the idea towards towards getting, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Ontario, any anybody, nobody with any political science degrees or just a random sampling of people who were interested. And they, the idea was to, to look into creating a different way by which politicians are elected. They loved the experience. They said the work was fascinating. They came up with something which they thought was very novel. And it was overwhelmingly rejected by the electorate at the ensuing election. Does that take any of the shine off this experience for you? Uh, it raises questions about how to articulate the work of um, these uh, groups that deliberate in sort of like, um, uh, you know, uh, small circles. After all, 160 people, it's not that many people and the rest of the public. So we need to have a better communication between these uh, ordinary citizens that have the space and time and luxury to deliberate in depth and become informed about very complex topics and the rest of the citizenry which doesn't have the time and, and, and access to that um, experience and knowledge. So how do we bridge that gap? I think uh, we know that in the case of Ireland, they figured it out. So in Ireland, in 2012, you had a similar experiment uh, run on the question of um, marriage equality. Uh, they tried with a hybrid uh, format with 66 uh, randomly selected citizens and 33 uh, uh, regular uh, politicians. And that created a trust between the two constituencies, if you will, so that then when the referendum came, the parliament was behind the whole um, experiment and the proposal that came out of it. And so marriage equality passed in the referendum. Later in 2016, they renewed the experiment uh, with, on, on the very hot and, and contested topic of the decriminalization of abortion. This time they went pure random selection. So they had a, a group of 99 randomly selected citizens backed up by parliament and, and the, the media covered their debates. Um, there was a connection to the larger public. And there again, it worked. 66% of the population, roughly the same percentage as in the citizens assembly, voted to decriminalize abortion. So I think this can be done right. It's just that it takes time to figure out the, extra, the exact um, method and um, to bring people on board. So in fact, Canada was too early, you know, was, was right too soon in some ways. Uh, there we go, leading the pack again. That's the problem when you're the leaders in the world. Uh, I'm being facetious. Uh, tell me, though, some of the some of the little details that would need to be worked out. For example, how, if we were going to go to a kind of a, 
uh, a lawtocracy, if I can put it that way, uh, where you're, you're selected as an average citizen by a lottery to participate in this. Could you get out of doing it if you didn't want to do it? How long would the terms be for? What percentage of people do we think would be remotely interested in doing this kind of thing? Do we have answers for those kinds of questions? So um, I think, you know, we wouldn't want to force people to do it, um, though ideally this would be considered a high honor and a, you know, um, a rewarding experience. So in order to make that happen, you have to compensate people handsomely for all their time. Um, if these things were institutionalized and made quite frequent, I think people would see them as an opportunity to um, explore and learn and perhaps uh, get an education in some ways you know it would take some people outside of their very you know narrow um, environments and and give them an opportunity to, to to do something else later on because you you have access to resources experts other citizens um, maybe it's a way to open up your mind and and start a new uh, life uh, path and and perhaps a new career we've seen that for example in the context of the french citizen convention for climate that um, lasted between uh, october 2019 and and 21 and uh, the, the people who came in very skeptical disillusioned uh, angry even at the system came out for some of them eager to um, you know contribute in other ways join associations some of them are currently running you know in, in regional elections um, so it really gave them a sense of what's possible so I think the point is not to coerce people but to incentivize them to, to find a purpose in those um, uh, you know new forms of democratic participation and we know that people are actually quite eager once you open the door to that kind of experiment they're quite eager to, to, to well join. we actually have some evidence for that because we did uh, no, knowing that you were going to be on we did some polling on this here mm -hmm. and um exactly. you know we asked canadians if they thought that a political system could work on this kind of lottery basis where your name gets randomly selected and you're urged to participate in this kind of citizens assembly uh, what would the results be 34% of Canadians surveyed said, yes, they'd be interested in doing this. 41% wanted to be selected and wanted to participate, four in 10. Um, what would you try, or what would you say to the six in 10 who at the moment um, don't seem to be terribly interested in the idea? I would say just keep an open mind, try it. Judge for yourself. I think I've seen this transformative power of citizens' assemblies on uh, people who are skeptical. Came in, you know, the, the first day of the of the French Convention for Climate, there was this uh, guy who came in with his um, suitcase and wouldn't wouldn't let it go. He said, "I'm I'm I'm out of here in two hours." So, but in fact, he stayed, and he's he's one of those few that I thought of when when I said that some of them are currently running for elections and just very invested in political life now after years of being uh you know um uh, having given up on the system so i think they just have to give it a try what do they have would, to lose what do they have to lose indeed would there be political parties in your more open democracy it's an excellent question i actually think that we could envisage the possibility of a no party open democracy i think uh there wouldn't be parties in the traditional sense of machines to concur power uh you know uh through uh, you know uh, election and traditional traditional electoral means, but you'd still have associations of the like-minded uh, think tanks, groups of people who develop visions for society. Because the idea of, of an open democracy that at its center sits this legislative body that I call an open um, uh, mini public, and that mini public would have to be open and and receptive to um, the feedback of the rest of society. So associations of you know people who share a vision would have an incentive to to form and and feed that mini public and all the mini publics are sort of a, a networked with it so I, I i think that it would just be a different uh, society where the incentives are set up differently uh, but we still have plenty of occasions to, to to deliberate and talk and and push for certain agenda and uh, uh, policy platforms i'm sure there are many people particularly who do what you do for a living who think that uh, elections and the political process are sort of a, a grand clash of liberal versus conservative ideas. And I have to tell you, Lynn, most days, I, I, most days when I think about it, I think it often just comes down to, you know, it's the ins versus the outs. These guys are in and, and these guys are out. And every now and then we just need to shift it around every now and then. 
So does your, does, do the reforms that you represent, do they allow adequate positioning for conservative versus liberal and that kind of thing? So you're right that the system we have currently, it's basically making us veer left and right, left and right, very abruptly, and with very little room for actual consensus uh, and, and an enormous uh, status quo bias, at least in the US. The system I have in mind would be a lot more consensus oriented in a way. It consists in building through deliberation, common goals, common solutions. And um, there's no saying whether it would go left or right on certain issues before you try it. Because for example, um, on um, environmental issues, uh, it's, it's it, the tendency probably to lean what you would consider left, I guess, uh, to be more uh, you know, in favor of uh, development of green energies and, and things like that, at least in the French context, this was quite clear. We've seen it also in Texas, where um, a few years ago, uh, Jim Fishkin organized a deliberative poll that basically turned around the, the, the policy from, you know, big oil towards, gr you know, green energies and, and things like that. But in South Korea, a few years ago as well, there was another one of those assemblies that, that took place and they recommended an, a, against the, the decision of the president, uh, his preference, to continue developing um, nuclear plants, for example. So it doesn't have to, you know, it's, it's re quite unpredictable which direction people will go. Uh, in Europe, for example, the, the random, um, randomly selected assembly that had to deliberate about the future of Europe came out against the integration of Turkey after looking at the facts and, the, and listening to experts. So, so you know, I think that um, the beauty of this is that you wouldn't be locked into partisan pre pre uh, prejudices, if you will, like uh, pre-commitments people are open because they come in not as a member of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. They come in as, as I say, Gerard from Normandy, or, you know, they, they don't, they don't, they come in as whole individuals with um, uh, various uh, dimensions to their personality, various concerns, various hobbies, etc. And so they're ready to change their minds, which is really not the case in the, in the current sort of partisan system we have. No, that is very sure. Uh, let's play a clip here. This is the American philosopher Cornell West. Uh, with, uh, well, raising some other kinds of objections to some of the ideas that you're advancing here. Let's hear what he's got to say, and then we'll come back and chat. Do you think people want to rule themselves? Well, it's a tough question. Dostoevsky raised the question, is it not the case that most people fear freedom? Is it not the case that most people would rather be followers of authority rather than authorize themselves? That's the Dostoevsky challenge. Uh, in that sense, Dostoevsky is like Plato. Plato's challenge to democracy, Dostoevsky's challenge to people who want to be free. How many people really want to be free? James Baldwin said, very few. The burden is too much. Tell me what to do. The burden is too much. Are you at all concerned that uh, political involvement may not be as universal a desire as you hope? Uh, I'm not concerned because my model of an open democracy doesn't require um, extreme political involvement at all times. It's not a model of direct democracy. On the contrary, it's really centering a new idea of democratic representation. So that means if you choose to raise your kids for a, you know the next 10 years, or if you prefer poetry, or if you just don't care about politics right now, you don't necessarily have to be massively involved all the time. So it's not the model of an uh, ancient uh, democracy where you know it was part of like uh, your duties to be in the uh, you know public forum all the time but that said I do think that uh, we underestimate the potential and the desire that people have for connections through politics and the public thing and, and politics can take many forms it doesn't have to be this cliche of, of you know um, demonstrations or, or um, canvassing or uh campaigning in the traditional ways in the very electoral centric partisan centric ways i think that there are all kinds of ways to be engaged in a community and be political the youth knows that they, they are being probably the most political generation in a long time and and they don't vote much so i think that um that that depends on what we mean by political commitment or participation i think i would like to see um Contributing to Wikipedia, for example, as a political act, uh, you know, educating your children about 
you know, the, 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 the right way to settle disagreements. Um, or if you're a student uh, trying to, you know, lobby to change um, the system for, for the selection of delegates towards something like a random selection, like what uh, Adam Cronkright has tried in, in Bolivia, for example. So I think that there's all kinds of ways to, to be involved and people are really eager uh, to, to, to have a sense of belonging and, and um, you know, and, and, and agency. And I think that's what I would like to try to give them through this ideal of, a, of an open democracy. True enough, but it also harkens to mind that old line attributed to Oscar Wilde, in which he says the, the, the biggest problem with socialism is that it, it takes too many meetings or something like that. That's the gist of the line. Has he got a point? Again, I don't uh, ask uh, people in my open democracy to go to too many meetings. I ask them to simply accept that once in a while they might be um, required to go and be part of a, of a you know, lotocratic body for a few weekends sometimes a few months and maybe if we go that far a few years so the, the commitments could be a very very different type but i think the probability of being involved for just a few weekends would be higher and i don't think it's that taxing uh, especially if we make it easy by um paying people handsomely as i said uh you know covering um child care traveling you know Costs. Uh, maybe if we use also new technologies that make it easy to perhaps have those meetings from home at convenient times. And ultimately, the truth is that I would like us to also rethink the entire ecology of our political institutions, including our economy, for example. I think that in the US especially, people, people work way too much, uh, which means they don't have time to, I mean, those who work, they don't have time to, um, you know, focus on other things that contribute to their you know, identity as, as a, or the full development as human beings. And, and so if we made it possible for people to take a leave from um, their, their job to, to go and devote time to civic activities, I think that would be an improvement um, and, and a way to, to just make our societies just generally more, more livable, more humane. And then in our last minute here, I want to ask you a bit of a personal question in as much mm -hmm. as you are a professor at Yale University. This is one of the most prestigious and elite universities in the whole world. You are teaching and, and helping develop the next generation of elites who presumably are going to take their place in politics and the other institutions of our world. And yet you seem very much to be siding with the anti-elitism populist movements of our day. And I wonder whether you think that puts you into a bit of an odd box every now and then. It does. I have to say, um, this is kind of uh, a strange place to be. But so I'll tell you that the way I reconcile myself with that is that one, I teach amazing students who are incredibly idealistic. So they self-select into my classes, maybe, but I think it has spillover effects. They talk to their roommates and hopefully <laughs> slowly converting them one by one to a, a better vision for, for society, I'm hoping. Um, they, I get a lot of pushback from them. They're very smart. They, they come sometimes from more conservative backgrounds, economically, you know, uh, conservative backgrounds. And so we, we have extremely interesting conversations. I'm, I'm probably wrong about a bunch of things, so I just hope they take some of those ideas and turn them you know, into something better. And the other way I, I reconcile myself with, with, um, with that is that um, I, I, I make them contribute to Wikipedia, for example. So I hope that I add to the sum total of knowledge and, and give access to that sort of knowledge that I um, share uh, you know, with, with um, other people. And finally, I. I'm on the Senate of my university where I'm pushing for the use of random selection to no avail so far, but I'm also trying to change the culture there. And it's really hard. It's quite an uphill battle. Hmm. Well, your book is getting and your ideas are getting a great deal of public attention and discussion right now, which is all to the good and suggests that there are a lot of problems with our current democracy that need fixing and good for you for putting some ideas out there as alternative suggestions. And we thank you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views with us. Merci, Hélène. Merci. Goodbye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.